The guides seem to recede, a little, their presence seemed to just recede a bit. It's hard to talk about space in like a dimension that's not defined by space really. They seem to recede and then I was aware of my father's energy, but of his presence and he had passed a few months prior. He was communicating telepathically, we weren't talking. His love for me and I was so happy to see him. Hello and welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host. Thank you so much for joining us today. And our guest is Sarah Jane. She had one of the most profound near-death experiences I've heard. Sarah Jane had an NDE where she experienced an incredibly detailed life review, met her lost loved one she calls the welcoming party and received powerful insights on time and space. Her life changed forever afterwards. Sarah shares her story to help others connect with their soul guidance and to uncover their life purpose and path. Sarah Jane, welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. You have a profound near-death experience, but first I'd just like to start with a just a background for the audience. I know you, you've had a many, many years in medicine and you were diagnosed with a severe autoimmune disease, if you don't mind sharing that for the audience. Okay, so like the, the cliff notes, the compacted version. Yes, I, um, whatever suits you. <laughs> okay, so I, yes, yeah, so I've dedicated most of my life to my love of the heart. I worked in specialty cardiac imaging and that was with, I should say, with my father. I trained and worked in his practice along his, um, beside him and that was like the most fulfilling, rewarding role um, and I did that for 20 years. Peppered in amongst that, I had a few things that we kept saying, oh, that's bad luck too. And probably in hindsight, I now look back and go, they were warning signs that something wasn't right. And the first was when I delivered my first ba second baby, I had what's called a broad ligament hematoma. So I bled out internally. And then I actually had... I was taken to surgery and had my first near-death experience on the operating table delivering him. And um, do you want me to talk about that? Because sure. it was yes, not please. as consolidated just, as the second. But just a, I view briefly, it now, if you don't mind. Thank you. I view it now as like I think that happened to prepare me for the second one, even though it was many years before. Um, I was taken to surgery. I had it had been hours before it was discovered. And at the time there weren't many described cases in the literature. And the surgeon did say he didn't know what he could do to save me, that he would try. Um on the op I was in immense pain. On the operating table, um I was aware that I had I was above my body, watching the operation, watching um, the anaesthetist saying my blood pressure was crashing and the surgeon saying he couldn't stem the bleeding. I was at the base of the bed on the right-hand side above near the operating light. When I say I, my consciousness was above watching the body down below, which was mine, and... Um, I was aware of everything that was being said and where everyone was. Um, and then I felt the energy or presence of my grandfather next to me. And he just said, it's not your time. You need to go back. And I felt his love. And then the next thing I know, I was waking up in a post-op recovery ward and I did tell my surgeon and anaesthetist afterwards that I had observed myself dying on the table. I clinically died on the table 
and I told them what they were saying, where everyone was, and they both um, collaborated with what I was saying. They agreed with they had said a joke before things went south and I was aware of that. Um, and, yeah, so that was my first near-death experience. The reason I think I didn't, I, t- I talked to them about it, I think the reason I didn't really think about it much after that, I was very sick after that. I had a lot of cardiac complications. I had my first episode of heart inflammation, which we again went, that's bad luck. So the hematoma, the pericarditis, the I couldn't sit up for two months after it. I kept passing out because I'd lost so much blood. I couldn't have a blood transfusion because of the inflammation of my heart. So I was really quite sick afterwards and just trying to get back to health. And I just went back to work and I didn't really think about it. I don't know. I, I look back now and I'm like, that's weird. I probably should have gone on, you know, I existed out of my body and but I just went back to life and went back to work. Um, I had a few episodes of inflammation in my heart over the next couple of years. I was told not to get pregnant again and that I would not survive fertility-assisted pregnancies. We all thought, well, that's not going to be a problem. Um, But I fell pregnant again three and a half years later. And when I delivered that baby, I had a stroke. And that was another thing, you know, we all put down to bad luck. Um, So I won't go into that too much, but it was a stroke on the left side of my body, which affected my speech. Um, I had to learn trying to talk again and walk again and all those fun things post-stroke. We just, I just kept everything that happened. I just kept getting back up and going again. Um, But when I turned 40, I just started getting really, really exhausted, Um, started experiencing brain fog, started all my joints, started hurting, and that was the beginning of the presentation of um, a rare autoimmune condition, which was saw me like over four to eight weeks. I slowly started getting worse and worse and worse and saw me in hospital with complete uh, start in organ failure and heart failure and initially the disease um autoimmune disease you how i would explain it is it picks an organ in systemic cases that and it just doesn't recognize it anymore so it could be blood cells that doesn't recognize your own blood cells for me it was my heart so it was like having a heart transplant And you had to have anti-rejection therapy so you didn't reject your own heart. That's what I was commenced on. Um, It took about six months to get the diagnosis. I was in a cardiac ward in hospital and really sick. I couldn't walk with arthritis. And that started a 10-year fight where it not only attacked my heart, my disease started attacking my brain as well. So I had... um, eight episodes of meningitis over 10 years and I was in heart failure. I couldn't have stem cell treatment because I had a heart attack. Um, So I had lots of life-threatening experiences over 10 years and ultimately um, failed every treatment that was available and got to the point where in the last year, um, I don't know why I say last year because I still have some symptoms, but I'm not a, in a full flare. But in that final year before my NDE, I um, had failed everything available and was commenced on aggressive chemotherapy and the highest dose that you could have every week, which kept me going, but I was not really going. I was really sick. Um, I didn't live. I just existed. Anyway, um, ultimately that failed. And when a treatment fails for me, it's me developing meningitis, 
heart failure, fluid around the heart, inflamed myocardium, and that's how it presented, like it had every other time. So we knew it had failed and I'm in hospital um, trying to survive that. The thing is, what do we do? So we were waiting for approval to use an experimental treatment, which was proving hard to get approved because it was experimental. Um, And I was stabilised using a treatment that we had had some success, which was very high doses of methylprednisolone pulsed into your body, which is dangerous in itself, but it's the necessary evil. I had that and I was stabilised. I was in heart failure, but I was allowed home because there was not much else that could be done while we waited for this other drug. And I had three children at home and I was in a Sydney hospital and I, by this point, after 10 years of being pretty much in hospital a lot, I wanted to be home. I was allowed home to wait. Um, and that was when my second NDE happened. The treatment that I was on in hospital had stabilised me but was starting to wear off, meaning the inflammation in my brain was coming back again. So encephalomeningitis, I was in ex- like excruciating pain and my heart function was so low that I couldn't really do anything other than breathe. Like I couldn't care for myself. Um, but I was there and the kids could come home from school and sit on my bed and I couldn't really interact that much with them. But I was there to hear them, to see them, to hug them. Um, So on the day of my NDE, um, that's how I was pretty much living breath to breath. I could have been in hospital, but I didn't see the point. They couldn't do anything else. Um, I woke up knowing that it was going to be my last day and I can't even tell you anyone now how I knew. I I just knew. I, I woke up with a knowing that this was my last day and I wouldn't be here tomorrow. I wasn't distressed about it because I was pretty sick and exhausted and I knew there was not much else we could do and let's try and get this new experimental treatment. Um my husband brought the children home and they just did what they usually do, sat on my bed doing their homework, chatting chatting to me. Um, I was probably quite a comedic scene because when you have meningitis, you can't handle light. So I lived in dark, big dark Hollywood-style sunglasses. I had no hair from chemo, so I had a big scarf around my head to keep me warm and I look back at like I think we've got one photo from that time and I was like if I had any idea what I it's just like it's quite funny it's like a desperate Hollywood star looking really funny but anyway I looked quite comedic in the bed um my children I remember really drinking them in I, I mean I I used to do that anyway because life had been quite touch and go with a heart attack and um, other experiences. But I do remember being very, very aware that I was just drinking in every, trying to through the pain, the pain of the meningitis and trying to just drink in every moment of being with my babies. And um, they went to bed probably 8.30, 9 o'clock, they were still young. And when my husband came in to check on me, he asked if I was okay and, I mean, like I was as okay as you could be. I just said, yeah, um, and I said, um, I need you to know that I love you and I need you to know that this is my last day. I'm not going to be here tomorrow. And look, in saying that, now people say to me, why would you not have gone to the hospital? And that is what he said to me, well, if you think that we should go back to the hospital, 
And I just, I didn't want to die in hospital. I wanted to be in my bed and I guess I had spent so much time in hospital and I knew what could they do. Um, and anyway, so I convinced him. We had a little pact. I said, okay, and he, he did say, look, you've been sick like this before. You always fight. You always come through. And just being my cheerleader and... So we made a pact and I said, yeah, you're right. I just feel sick. It's okay. If I still feel like this in the morning, we'll go to emergency. And emergency for, for me couldn't be the country, country hospital. It had to be a city hospital so that they were equipped to deal with me. Um, and he I know he tried to stay awake watching me, but he fell asleep as you do. You can't beat that overpowering. And... I was aware of my body shutting down and the only way I can explain that is I was conscious of breathing became harder and I was conscious of it sort of like if you went around the house turning the light switches off, it felt like that in my body. It felt like all the light switches were being, someone was going around and turning all the light switches off and I... I mean, I was, anyone who's had meningitis would probably understand. I was in so much pain. I actually begged my husband, like, cut my head off. I can't do this anymore. It's just so painful. It was just, I was in so much pain and I could feel my energy. And look, at this time, a point in my life, I didn't even know the word soul. I didn't know the word consciousness or energy I didn't talk like that I talked in medical scientific terms of what the body was going through and that's how my body was probably registering what was going on more in medical terms not my energy is leaving my body but I was aware that it felt like my energy was leaving my body and how I can say it is it left through my feet I was aware that my energy or my consciousness or awareness. I, I was aware that I was up at the ceiling height looking down at my body and I wasn't distressed. I was actually the moments before I left my body, the pain had been taken, had gone, had just I remember the moments before feeling at peace and the pain had dissolved. I remember being aware that the pain's just gone and I felt at peace and then my energy left my body. So I was not distressed. I was at peace. I was observing my body and I was thinking, which is a weird thing to say because I no longer had a mind or brain to think, but I was thinking thoughts, looking at the body. I think the first thing I think the first thing that I thought was that's weird, that doesn't look like me. And I think in retrospect now looking back, I think when your energy leaves your body, you don't look like you anymore. Um, I didn't feel attached to my body. I actually felt quite detached. And I felt a lot of compassion. I, I remember feeling sending compassion to that body that had been through so much suffering. I remember sending compassion. And the other thing that I was very aware of was that I felt like me, completely like me, like the whole me, my like I had still had a body, like a, I guess I would call it a phantom body, like if you amputate a limb, an amputee would say they can still feel their limb, they can feel phantom pain and they still feel maybe it's a hangover from having that body for that life. But I, even though I wasn't in a body, I felt like I was me, exactly how I was in my human jumpsuit and even down to how I feel like my personality and my characteristics and I'm a curious and inquisitive 
person and that's sort of how I was. I was curious. I was curious that I was aware. I was like now I'm thinking like it was no different to being in the body, only I wasn't. So it's just like same me. I was just me. Um, I was then aware of I'd like to say the word pulling, but it wasn't a pulling. Um, it was like an anti-gravity pulling me through the ceiling, which left, like there was no ceiling to go through anymore, but pulling me up. And even then I feel resistant to stay up because I feel like there's not an up or a down or a sideways. It was just a transition from this dimension to the other one without wanting to give it direction. But it was an anti-gravity pull towards what I was then aware of, of this magnificent, magnificent bright white light that was emanating everywhere and had no source to look for a source it was just it was the most beautiful love that's the only way I can describe it was I knew the light was love I knew it had it I knew it was consciousness I knew it was where I had come from I knew it was part of me I knew it was where I returned to and I knew it was the foundation of everything. I I just I I had no like it was like I know the, I, I know this without even thinking about it. Um but it but the light was love. It was just love. And it was pow- more powerful than anything I felt on earth in my human life um it was unconditional just this unconditional non-judgmental beautiful love that loved me and I was I was really I I guess I would say the conscious thought was that's God light is God but that light is love God is love I I guess that's what I was aware of at that point was just that awareness that oh yeah like when I was little I was told God is love oh and then it hit me oh God is it's love love is the foundation of consciousness it's what created me it's the foundation of everything it's love and it felt the most be- just the most beautiful, most magnificent love. I don't know how to give it any more language than that. Um, I was aware um, in, I mean, I can't even give it time. It's like time, I can't tell you how long I existed in this above watching my body or in any part of my NDE time dissolved sort of like my pain dissolved um like I wasn't experiencing any definition between me and anything else so like my physicalness sort of dissolved everything sort of dissolved so that there's no time there's no physical boundary of me to anything else it's sort of that's the only way I can explain it dissolves a funny term but that's all I can come up with I feel quite limited with words I feel like I need a new dictionary of a whole lot of new words to try and explain and experience that we don't have the language to explain and I wish I did. I wish I had a whole new book of words to try and illuminate what the experience was like for me. 
the next um, part was um, the so in the light that the awareness of presence of beings, like aware of, and then the awareness of knowing things that you just have a knowing. Like I know they're my guides. These are guides that I've known forever that have been with me in every incarnation and that are guiding me through each incarnation. And I was telepathically, and no words, there was telepathic communication from there seemed to be a more prominent or lead guide and that's probably an inaccurate way of describing it, more of a presence. And I knew it was the my master guide and then there were two other guides that I also recognised as guides from every lifetime. The communication was um, a review, like, there's a review of the life that I've just lived. Um, now I'd like to say a screen appeared, but as with all things in this experience, like saying a room or a door, it's not like a physical room or a physical door, but an energetic representation of. So I would I will say a screen where I not only viewed but I experienced scenes. I viewed, experienced and reviewed scenes from the life and not just from my perspective but from the perspective of others that were in that scene. Scene, it's a weird way to talk about life, but that what I was viewing or partaking in. And how I viewed it was through feeling and not only how I felt but how the other person felt. And if I had said or done something that had a positive effect, then I would feel the effect of my words or my actions that the other person was experiencing but I was also aware of how that rippled out in their life and the ripple effect on many others. On the other hand, if I had said or done something that had a negative effect like pain or suffering to another, I experienced that as well. And the negative impact they, that may have had ongoing to others it was a felt experience of my life but of everyone that was in my life and so how I had impacted everyone um and it has it's like it's had a huge impact on me now coming back knowing that but I think the other thing that I was aware of in that experience was the intent held within me behind what I was saying or doing the intent of it was what was reviewed or what was felt so it's intention how we the intention with which we put into our words and our actions are actually really important. Like they're really important. The intent is important into how it interacts with consciousness, with what we create, like what we're creating, the reality we're creating for our life and others. Um, and I hadn't really given that thought while I was alive. I don't think I actually, I actually feel like I didn't give much thought but I didn't give that any thought while I was alive about my intents um I do now um so I'm not able to say what how long that took it could have taken 30 years it 
like it could have taken a hundred years. It seemed to take a long time, but it was it may have been minutes, um, seconds. I don't know. There's no time continuum. Um, the when that ended, I was then aware of. My, the guides seem to recede, a little, their presence seemed to just recede a bit. It's hard to talk about space in like a dimension that's not defined by space really. They seemed to recede and then I was aware of my father's energy, but his presence and he had passed a few months prior um, when I, uh, um, March, this was no end of November, he had passed and um, he was communicating telepathically. We weren't talking. His love for me and I was so happy to see him. Um, he was communicating and he looked, he looked so different. He, he passed when he was 92 and he looked like he did when he was 35 big curl hair, like robust, physically fit, healthy, in his suit with his stethoscope around his neck, how he always looked. And he just looked young and healthy. And he communicated that he knew what I'd been through and that he was proud of my fight. Um, he held out his hands like you would and then when you have little kids, you hold out your hands to beckon them to come. And then he communicated um, Sari Fairy to me, which was what he called me when I was a young girl. And he turned his head towards the right. So his awareness, he directed his awareness to the right and off to the side and I followed he sort of like energetically I knew to follow his awareness to look in to look through my awareness I don't have eyes I don't I'm looking through awareness I guess that's the only way to describe it you don't have a mind to think but you have consciousness that is aware and you are looking through the lens of your soul I guess through your awareness um I was looking in that and I was actually curious because I was aware of what I was placing my awareness on seemed to unfold and expand infinitely and I don't know how to exp explain the expansion of consciousness I guess that's the unfolding and expansion of it was like I remember watching when I was a young girl, um, the Scottish moors and the fog rolling over the Scottish moors, that's the only metaphor that I can sort of liken it to is just the unfolding of consciousness. And I knew that's what I was watching and I knew that what I placed my awareness on, that's how it interacted with consciousness and that's what happened, your awareness is a powerful tool because that's what happens and I, I guess that's what happens here in physical form, what we put our awareness on expands or un becomes your reality and unfolds. Um, so I was looking at, looking at that and I guess the communication was more like, not like a lesson about it, but I think it was more like, I guess my impression was, I'd like to say how cool is that? Like he was always, t he was my mentor through medicine and he was, he um sort of like, look at that. And I, I, I remember think, like thinking, being aware of that. Um, and then um, it seemed like the, my guides moved back into presence to my awareness and my father receded again. And it was communicated that I had to, we, we were going into um, 
a room that it's not a room but it there was a doorway but there wasn't a doorway there was a distinction between places where I went from this to the other and they were very distinct different areas and this when I passed through a doorway it was like a a chamber that was semicircular like curved but there was no physical it's it's almost like I I if I had to describe it in physical form it was like a curved room that was a chamber and it was but it, there wasn't any physical representation of that but I knew it had a defined curvature to it and that it was a safe place and that my guides communicated to me was like a healing room I guess I, guess I call it a healing chamber and through the telepathic communication, I was directed to the center of this healing space. And then I was aware of three other beings. Um, if so, if I, I, I like to say I lay down, and I, I know it's weird saying I walked or I lay down when I didn't really have a physical body, but I had a presence or essence that could lie down my lie down and head and toe feet and um so I lay down and my master guide was at my the head and then my two other guides were beside me about here and then the other three beings were at the base of my feet and then to the sides of me and they so they were a circle around me and I was communicated that I would be having a healing from all that my soul had been through in the physical human life and it was a vi it was vibrational it was like a like a like a vibrational hum that they all were emitting, even though they weren't speaking or there wasn't noise coming from a mouth, it was a vibrational frequency that I can only liken to sort of like a, a hum that was held within the space that went through me, like through me and felt like, I don't know, like warm liquid like a he a healing um I don't know how long I was in that space for um at the end of the healing it was communicated to me that I was to go back out to the entrance and when I went out my father was there and he did play quite a significant role in my NDE I um I didn't um I didn't know what NDEs were and I didn't um really know anything about them but um I know everyone has a now I understand everyone has a different experience and that was mine um he was waiting for me and he um motioned to me that we were to go off in another and I don't want to say direction but I guess that's the only way I can use it in human terms to go off into another direction and when he looked and I followed um, his gaze where he was looking like with his telepathy communication it was that I was to follow him and we both moved in that direction together and what was in that direction was everyone I had ever known and loved in my lifetime who had passed and um, they were lined up either side of when I got up to them on either side and one side was um, all my father's parent, like his parents who I had never met, my grandparents and all of his sort of lineage from 
the human incarnation and my mother's side was on the, the right hand side was my grandparents and all of her side and then after that was dear friends and everyone that had I had love for in my heart they were all there and it was like a party atmosphere like a like a part like a like a really lovely Christmas lunch where everyone comes and everyone's happy to see everyone's like come in come and have some food or that sort of energy it was happy and send everyone vibrating so much love to me like and me back like there's the love that was held there and just all welcome it was like welcoming me like into a party and I was progressing closer and closer with my father beside moving and progressing and then and just like happy to see everyone I wasn't giving any thought to the life I'd left behind I was present in what was happening I didn't I was not there was nothing that was going through me about what I had just left um and the reason I say that is because as I progressed further it was like an energetic shock that just stopped me and I I just literally stopped and was aware that if I stepped over, I should say stepped, but if I stepped over a threshold, so like a threshold to a door and there wasn't a threshold but there was an energetic threshold, I knew if I stepped over that I wouldn't be going back, which, you know, now when I think about it I wasn't even thinking about I go back or anything but I I all of a sudden that knowing hit me. It was like it just hit me and I turned to my father and telepathically I communicated, if I go on, does does that mean I don't go back? And he, commun- he nodded and communicated to me that that's right. If you go over, if you go past this point, you have a choice now, but if you go past that point, you don't go back. There's no choice, but you get a choice now. You can stay here with me and we can go on and you can be free of pain, healthy and live like free. I think free of pain was the main thing that struck me because I had had so much pain, but free of pain and healthy and it's all okay. Or you can go back to your body, to that life, but you return to your, you return to being sick, and you return to quite, you know, challenges ahead of you with your illness and pain, and you go back to that. No choice is wrong. There's no, there was no judgment. It was, there was nothing that was communicated that either one was wrong, but in the instant that it was communicated, I was, no. I, I And I hadn't been thinking about it, but it was like instantly, no. I, I, I My love for my children, just I, I, I'm not, no, I, I want to go back. I want to be back with my children. And it was pretty much as soon as that choice was made, I felt myself like falling, like just falling in free, like a free fall back to my body while that was happening. And like I can't give it a time, but while that fall was happening, which was instant the moment I said no, I don't want to, I want to go back, I don't want to stay, it was like I had a power plug and I plugged into consciousness or and as I was falling, I was aware of downloading things that I had been thinking about, like time and space and energy and how that works and 
past lives and just information downloading quickly as I was got coming back to my body. And then I was aware in getting in, like getting into my body, it was dense and heavy and hard and that was the only time I w- was aware that when I was not in my body, it was a lot lighter and not dense and free and expansive. I wasn't aware of that contrast until I was back in trying to fit in my body, trying to fit. Like I felt very, const- I felt like I'd put on jeans that I'd put in the dryer, like way too tight, like this who shrunk my jeans. Like I was, it was tight and it was um, just felt, um, that was the feeling that I remember feeling. And then, but I do, the, the, you know, I wasn't aware that I wasn't breathing, obviously. I don't know. I wasn't thinking about it, but I was aware of trying to get air into my, like trying to breathe, trying to get air into my lungs. And that, woke my husband up and because he was asleep next to me like my (laughs) trying to breathe and it was like an instant thing where his hand went over and just grabbed my pulse and he was I guess he's um, medically trained that was always his I guess his instant thing to do when he felt I was crashing or something was to feel do I have a pulse is it thready what's and he was saying are you okay are you okay and I was yeah and I'm back and I'm back in my body and I'm back in my life and I could have been gone for a hundred years or I could have been gone for 10 minutes it there was no sense of how long I had been gone for but I was back in my body and I was back in immense pain and how I was before I left, really sick. And um, needless to say, I was taken to hospital and um, managed to get the experimental treatment, um, managed to get it into me and um, start. And it rescued the experimental treatment that I was able to have was... um, an infusion that was, you know, like day zero, day five, day it was infused in oncology over months, but it rescued me and pretty much has got me into remission. I've now been in remission four years, which is unfair. I never thought, but I, I knew, I don't, I knew when I came back that I would be well again. I, I, even while I was having all the treatment, I never doubted that I would get back to this, the person that can run kilometres and swim and think and talk and have a coherent thought process and not be in pain and um, my heart functions back to normal and pretty much living normal life now and but a very different one a very different one that's um been very much informed by what I experienced and I have tried to I I really didn't talk about it much when I um came back I know that's a weird thing to say when I came back I um always thought medical colleagues would say what they always say you know when you die you die and that's it your physical body dies and lights out that's what I was trained and that's what a lot of um I so I kept it to myself until I told a friend and Once I gave myself 
the space to sit with it all and let the insights and knowledge just my limited brain software that the human brain is took time to really really think about all that I experienced and actually what it means like we exist with a you know we exist beyond this and we're all one part of one consciousness we're all individual aspects of it but we're all connected and the main the main thing i've come back with is we're all just love we're all, it's really simple we're all we're all individual aspects of love and we all express ourselves in so many beautiful different ways but at the foundation we're all here to be love for each other and be love not um, a verb be it be it, just to be love to express love to be whatever our purpose is do it in service of others and with love as your intent my your intent is to be love in everything every it's it's like I mean I'm human like we're all human we all fall off a little bit we all have challenging experiences where it may be a little bit hard to turn to love as our intent but I think we're given opportunities in life to help us remember who we are and remember what we are and remember where we came from and what we're here to be and I think those opportunities sometimes turn up as an illness or as loss and they are perceived as challenges or suffering or pain but they're portals to opportunity to remembering what our true essence is and I think I have a very different perspective of what the decade or a little bit more preceding my NDE was and I don't call it suffering and I don't call it I look at it all now as a really lovely lots of lovely opportunities to remember that I'm love and I'm compassion and I try very hard now and that's why I've actually made a necklace and what I have inscribed on it is what would love do and in those challenging moments I now hold it and every question I now answer with that question what, what would love do here what would love say how would love turn up how would it have me act and how how would love have me be in this moment and I try very hard to anchor into that all the time now. And um, I guess that's my main my main intent because I understand my intent's important and next life review, I want to see what my intent was in each moment to be that. <laughs> Sarah, yeah. that was that was so beautiful and amazing. Um and it is really hard to put into words, but you did a great job of it. I don't even have any questions. You kind of kept answering all of my questions. Um, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that honestly and openly and so bravely. Um, I guess my only question is you're doing some incredible work. Where's the best place for people to connect with you? Well, I'm trying very hard to put together... I've um I've got a, a, a few things that I'm working on but for as far as I'm trying to step into I I I haven't really stepped into my role of what I how I want to share this story and how I want to share insights and what you know what we can do with what we can learn from an NDE and I um I'm going to try and put workshops together. I am writing in the process of writing two books. And so I've got a um, 
website that's being built at the moment under my name, which is Sarah Jane. That website's sarahjane.com.au. It is construction at the moment. It will be up and running soon, so it will showcase um, the offerings that I'm going to start putting out there online and in-person work. Um, Also, there's um, Soul to Soul Conversations, which is a podcast I'm about to start doing. Um, All the um, social media for Soul to Soul is on Instagram and Facebook and and my charity, the Autoimmune Project, that's on Instagram and Facebook. So you can always contact me through those things. And hopefully when my website's up and running and I'll have um, the Instagram running alongside that. And, yeah, I'd like to try and just consolidate a little bit of soul work now. I um, I have been felt really challenged with how do I, apart from healing, how do I, how do I step into what I know I'm here to do? Um, I am aware that my purpose now is a little bit different to before. It was um, I'm always a healer. I know that I always step into a healing role in every lifetime. It's a little bit different each time. And while prior to my NDE I was healing and my love for the heart was, you know, I love, I love the heart. I just... I loved diagnosing. I loved working with the heart. Now I'm I'm not abandoning that. I'm just understanding the role of the heart as a communicator from the soul through to the body and how the soul communicates via the heart through our somatic experiences to give us feelings within our cells, our tummy. I'm I think we can all tune into our soul and get guidance and help direct us for our meaning and our purpose at, on an individual level. Um, I'd like to walk, like work towards that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm working on at the moment, how I can. Wonderful. And I will, support. I will leave a link below in the show notes for people to connect with you. Gosh, I'm, I'm just thinking about your experience is so detailed and so beautiful. Thank you so much. Is there anything else? you'd like to share with the Passion Harvest audience on a final note? Live your life with passion, but with your soul, <laughs> with your soul, like connect with your soul. And it, it really does, in, it it infuses our passion. I, I've, I feel like if we tap in and listen, our passions are soul-directed. Like what we become so passionate about, our curiosity leads to that, but that's, like the knowledge of your soul guiding you, isn't it? It's just, I just, I feel like we can dampen down being passionate about things in life and now I'm like, no, ramp it up, let's do it. Let's do it all with so much passion. Like if you even just walking on the beach and feeling the water, it's just everything's amazing. Like when you can't do it and then you're able to do it. Just being aware. Awareness is your tool. It is like awareness is a really important tool and having awareness of your awareness is something that I think if we all could master that a little bit better and be able to direct your awareness, like I said, in um, the other dimension I understood awareness was really important in what unfolds and expands in your in that dimension. It's the same here. Your awareness is very powerful. And um, I think there's just a few little tools that we can use to infuse our lives, make them, like you say, just full of passion and joy and love. Yeah. My last word is just everyone be love. Everyone just let's just all be love. It's all about and, love. Yeah, it's simple. It's really yeah. simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. Yeah, just let that be our intention. So. I don't thank know. I feel you. like I- that was beautiful and a great way to end the show. Sarah, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. Really, really my, amazing. My pleasure. I really enjoyed being with you. Thank, thank you. you very much. <laughs> I feel really privileged to be able to come on and talk with you. Thank well, you. Well, I feel privileged you've come on. So thanks so much. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> if you liked this episode, please do subscribe.